Good afternoon. Okay. My name is Francisco Aragon, and I direct Letras Latinas, the literary initiative at the Institute for Latino Studies here at Notre Dame. Welcome to Latinx Poetics, a one-day gathering. Although that is a bit of a misnomer, since tomorrow morning we will be conducting our final video interview with our distinguished poets. We recorded our first two earlier today, and the third will be this evening for an audience, which I hope will include many of you here now, for this is our first of two public sessions. This morning, a couple of our visiting poets were guests in my class, Latinx Poetry Now, and last night, some of them broke bread with our MFA students. And speaking of graduate students, the three poets we are featuring this afternoon will be formally introduced by the following MFA candidates, Elena Johansson, Emiliano Gomez, and Kristen Garza. You can read more about them in the printed program. After the poets read from their work, Kristen will moderate a conversation with the three of them about their contributions to this book, Latinx Poetics, Essays on the Art of Poetry, edited by Ruben Quesada and published recently by University of New Mexico Press. But before we transition to our first poet, I want to invite to the podium Paul Cunningham, who, in addition to being a distinguished alum of our creative writing program, is also the program's current manager. The creative writing program is our co-presenting sponsor, and Paul will offer a few words about a program that has been a consistent collaborator with Letras Latinas. Please join me in welcoming Paul Cunningham. Uh, thank you, Francisco. And um, thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, good evening. Um, thank you for joining us for Latinx Poetics, a one-day gathering, a celebration inspired, as Francisco said, by poet, translator, and editor Ruben Quesada. Um, uh, again, my name is Paul Cunningham. I'm the, I'm the uh, creative writing program manager. And like Francisco, I'm an al alumnus of the same outstanding MFA in creative writing program. I have proudly returned to serve this program, its award-winning faculty, our incredibly gifted students, and our campus community's uh, connection to the city of South Bend. Students, now alumni, like Tess Gunty, the class of 2015, whose recent debut novel, The Rabbit Hutch, was named the National Book Award winner this past November. Nasli Koka, the class of 2020, whose debut novel, The Applicant, was recently reviewed in the New York Times. And Thomas Earl Jones, class of 2019, who will return to campus next Wednesday to read from his debut memoir, Sync, which has received rave reviews from the New York Times Book Review, The Washington Post, Vulture, and The Philadelphia Inquirer. We also hope you'll join us again in DCO Hall's English Commons the following Wednesday, April 26th, for the return of another talented alumna and musician, Austin Wallers, the 2022 recipient of our Sparks Prize Fellowship. Finally, you are all invited to attend this year's final thesis reading happening here in McKenna Hall on Friday, April 28th, featuring readings from our graduating MFA candidates Lance Carroll, Armin Chowdhury, Zoe Darcy, Kristen Garza, Uri Kim, Angela Rang, Jacob Moniz, and Callie Peed. The University of Notre Dame is a very exciting place to be a writer right now. We have a new reading series, the Kelly Reading Series, set to launch in fall 2023, along with many, many other exciting events planned for the 2023-2024 academic year. With that said, on behalf of the Creative Writing Program, we're very pleased to co-sponsor today's Latinx Poetics event, and I hope you'll join me in giving tonight's incredible lineup of poets and speakers another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Paul. Since he mentioned it, 2023, 2024, um, I was going to wait until tonight, but I'll say it again tonight. Uh, April 10th of 2024, in the ballroom just down the hall, we'll be hosting with a number of campus co-sponsors, uh, the US Poet Laureate, Ada Limon, and a couple of other poets. Before I invite Elena to the podium, I'd like to also thank the Initiative on Race and Resilience and the Department of Romance Languages and Literature for their co-sponsorships. I also want to acknowledge the Poetry Foundation in Chicago for an Equity in Verse grant, which is providing the honoraria of our three visiting poets. And I want to extend a warm welcome to Idalbi Noriega from the Poetry Foundation, who is in attendance today. Finally, on the back page of your program, you'll note as well the generosity of private benefactors. One of them is with us today who made the trip from Washington, DC, Jim Wilson. Thank you, Jim. And now please join me in welcoming to the podium Elena Johansson, who will introduce our first poet. I don't want to be too close to it. Cheryl Luna was born and raised in El Paso, Texas. She received her BA from Texas Tech University, her PhD from the University of North Texas, and her MFA from the University of Texas at El Paso. Luna has been awarded fellowships from the Corporation of Yaddo, the Anderson Center, the Rock Valley Foundation, and Canto Mundo. She received the Alfredo Cisneros del Moral Foundation Award from Sandra Cisneros in 2008. She has published three books of poetry, Pity the Drowned Horses, which was awarded the inaugural Andres Montoya Prize, a poetry prize from, uh, by Robert Vasquez, Seven, which was a finalist for the Colorado Book Award, and most recently, Magnificent Errors, selected as the winner of the Ernest Sandin Prize by Orlando Mendez and Trayel McSweeney. Luna's poetry has appeared in the Georgia Review, Puerto del Sol, Poetry, Calliope, the Notre Dame Review, and countless more. Luna's poetry arcs. It arches its back and it wails. Across their three bodies, the books, separate yet one. I, alone in the landscape, the reader and the reader are brought to we, unfolding as music. As we faces the landscape, the reader enters, possesses her, this we, this collective stride and embrace, tender and violent, taking on and partaking of the poems, each as individual entities building the reader sunken in the landscape. And we cannot but sing for the gilded moon, the thin drifting sky. The we bleeds a saturation before the reader coating the reader in red bows, cold green water, the Azul River, the indigo vein, the cerulean birds. The reader enveloped in an environment, enveloped in color, taken from their familiar and brought into the border. A border is a place of abjection. It is a separation between one and another. Luna's work is saturated with borders, the border between El Paso and Juarez, the border between furor and paciencia, the border between the I and the I and the I. These poems are each a coming into the self. They are part of collections coming into themselves, a body coming into itself. These poems are an embodiment, what it means to be I. To be I in a sea of eyes and to be welcomed, to come into we. We all unfold as music, but this music takes us towards ourselves and away. Please welcome Cheryl Luna. Um, thank you, Elena. That was beautiful. <laughs> I feel that you, you have a gift. I mean, that was very poetic. I'm very appreciative. Thank you. I would like to thank Francisco Aragon, the um, Institute of Latino Studies, 
Letras Latinas, uh, Orlando Menes, who I have a great honor that he chose my manuscript. And he has, he has done a lot in terms of my writing and poetry. I'm very appreciative. I would like to thank Joelle McSweeney for her support as well, um, and the Poetry Foundation and the donors um, that make this possible. So I'm very honored to be here. It's a big honor, thank you. The first one I'm gonna read is called Lowering Your Standards for Food Stamps. It's the first poem in the collection. Words fall out of my coat pocket, soak in bleach water. I touch everyone's dirty dollars. Maslow's got everything on me. 14 hours on my feet, no breaks, no smokes or lunch. Blank-eyed movements, trash bags, coffee burner, fingers numb. I am hourly protestations and false smiles. The clock clicks, it's slow, slowing. Faces blur in a stream of hurried soccer games, sunlight and church certainty. I have no poem to carry, no material illusions. Cola spilled on hands, so sticky fingered, I'm far from poems. I'd write of politicians, refineries, and a border's barbed wire, but I am unlearning America's languages with a mop. In a summer red hot polyester top, I sell lotto tickets. Cars wait for gas, billowing black. Killing time has new meaning. A jackhammer breaks apart a life. The slow globe spirals, and at night, black space has me dizzy. Visionaries off their meds and whacked out meth heads sing to me. A panicky fear of robbery and humiliation drips with my sweat. Words, some say, are weeping twilight and sunrise. I am drawn to dramas, the couple arguing, the man headbutting his wife in the parking lot. 911, no metered Ovid, and nobody but myself to blame. Um, the second one I'm going to read. Uh, deals with um, what happened under the Trump administration with the uh, um, immigrants. Uh, Tornillo's tent prison for migrant children. There's a compulsion to sing of ranches outside El Paso, where cumbias and gritos keep everyone happy. Meditating on the familiar I remember the fence, the border, and being alone. Better to be in the open desert than caged. Men in rags once slept on our lawn. Look, I am honoring men and mothers who cry. Tornillo, a tent city, 471 parents deported without their children. Pesos traded for freedom that never came. What is it that divides us? A fence, metal reaching high to the sky, along a highway, or hate? Juarez's huge Mexican flag flaps nearby. I walk down a sandy path. All that is familiar, a mirage. There is only one pond in El Paso at Esquerate Park. The ducks there, thin and hungry for more than bread. The powerful 
have the strongest appetite. The buildings are teaching us all things fall. The demagogue bites cleanly. If I could calm the angry mob and send Mexico a song, I would. The Rio Grande, a slow dying hope. The Santa Fe Bridge and its crossers know what we don't or won't. The deportees are seeking tenderness. The shadow on the wall of the Oval Office berates the universe. How bitterly we argue or remain silent. This is called Salt Shaker. I wrote this in a workshop where there were a number of homeless people participating. Uh, it was just such a wonderful experience uh, in Denver. So they told us to write a poem about an object, and I picked a salt shaker. I too have been shaken, spilled, crystallized, scattered. I have lived in a glass jar with a tin lid. The sounds of dinner talk muffled and echoing through my broken body. If you touch what is left of me, I am but a grainy texture, something to be sprinkled on something else. I am meant to add flavor, sass, to spice the world up, to give up my body for another's and lend what's broken a healing balm. Snow-like, I fall over the world, molecular, dazzling like forgiveness, like compassion. The whole of me long lost in the space of what was Dead Sea, Indian Ocean, the march of one man refusing violence against the earth. Half naked in sandals, Gandhi walked the salt march, each footprint a light step kissing the ground. I think I just have two more. This was also written in the workshop. It's called the Hard Times Workshop uh, in Denver out of Lighthouse uh, Writers Workshop. And this was a topic that was given to us. What I'd say if I had 15 minutes of fame. So, Gandhi's grandson throwing a too short pencil away, desiring a freshly sharpened one. Gandhi making him find the old one in the dark, in the trash out back, telling him waste is violence done to the world. It is quite unpoetic. Modify your thoughts. Sit in the four corners of the earth. Watch open sky, breathe its last. High in the hills, streams lit with sun tell a story. Water rushing, sounding its ancient call. Your face warm in the light, bare feet cool. There's nothing perilous here in the west while we bomb the hell out of them. Yet each footprint a light step kissing ground. And then this one is the final poem in the, man, in the collection. It's called The Transgression. We all unfold as music. Our desire appears each morning. It is white lit, bare branched hunger for the entire sky. Dogs bark at a man with a leaf blower. Doors open, close. My mind and yours lit by sun. Ravens caw, an unkindness tumults in the blue. We feel we learn our traumas too late, but we are as children, closing our eyes 
we see our salmon lit dawn, and it is no transgression to look towards ourselves with awe. Thank you. My eldest sister says she has a brain that remembers, and there's no helping it. That's funny. It coagulates time, stiffens the freedom of a moment, weaves today to the entire pattern of experience up to today. See, this is hard for me. I'm an incredibly stupid man. But it is the very air of the poetry of Adela Najarro. She morphs a moment, stitches a day into the context of a thousand of days, fragments abounding like so many stills. If you look at a painting long enough, it starts to move, breathe. The Euroborus of our lives, especially our simplest lives, especially her own, her Nicaragua, her America, this is the cyclic detail of her poetry. She looks out at a winter Thursday, heavy with snow, remembers a love named John, remembers her pigtails on her fierce little girl head. It is stilled, given vantage, given lines, but cannot be said to be still. Dynamic destruction is the backdrop. Nature is on fire these days, against which Pliant pleas, delicate as plies, wondrous wails from the unmanicured border of wilderness, loving laments from a longing heart, a human heart, and it is hard to bear the fact that your mother suffers a Stockholm's need to work, that tanks steamrolled the grave of your great poets, that self-love is harder for fat girls, that you know two languages but cannot translate the MRI or the Virgin Mary. Still. There is love by the plateful, a Chicana exhibition, the shouts of trees, the beautiful little rhythm of hips, the breathing of a new life into the quotidian, and a clean sensibility, and a child's eye, and a, ground, and a grown Chicana Nicaraguan poet. There is above all this fact, that we have been changed by intimacy and love and will be changed. Well, that's just what I learned in Adela Najaro's first collection, Split Geography. It was published by Mouthfield Press in the same year Unsolicited Press, published Twice Told Over. She has also published a chapbook for exploring creative writing in the classroom, My Children's. With Adela Najaro, I knew I was reading poetry because reading her, I began to write poetry. There was no helping it. Though I would like more than just a final moment to think about her collaborative collection with painter Janet Trenchard, Volcanic Interruptions, which I adore for what it says about artistic trajectory, the state of ekphrasis, without further ado, please, please your applause for Adela Najaro. Thank you, Emiliano. That, um that was such a beautiful introduction because I felt somebody, I know, I touched you. Ay, gracias. <laughs> um, so thank you, everyone. And Cheryl, thank you for your beautiful poems and for everything you said about uh, the opportunity to be here in this room with everyone. So appreciated. And thank you to the donors and everyone who supports this. Um, so I'm just going to get going. Uh, I'm going to read a few poems. And the first one is called Volcanic Poetics. After the soldiers left bullet holes and torn mattresses, after iguanas ran off with the sun, after pericos emerged violently squawking, after the dictator collected music boxes and skulls, a song rose from the stink of a river festering yellow mud where one eye of a crocodile watched you, I, we, todos, break bones, break bodies. 
I want to tell you about after. How bones knit, courage rises, and we stave off despair. Once in that country filled with mango trees, where sharks live in fresh water, where monkeys are kept on leashes, where ice cream is salty, El Ministro de Cultura issued a call to language as action, a call to write poems about ordinary objects, and exteriorismo began stirring a pot of beans adding oil and then leftover rice to make gallo pinto, a plain dish that Danny likes, a child, our child, here in the States with Nika blood. Poems are his legacy, along with the lava-filled past that percolated a revolution of sound. Vida and ranas, ranitas, little froggies on a farm on the road to Momotombo. My mother's words explode volcanic vowels. Ay, como queman. The slow burn down the side of a mountain with its top blown off. Nature on fire. Poetry, a living thing. And uh, my next two books are from another collection, but my children's is kind of like a co collected poems that I um, edited so that it could be used in the classroom, middle school, high school, and college. Um, so, um, but I forgot to bring the third book. I can't believe it. So anyway, luckily the poems were in here too. And anyway, hi. So let me read you these two poems. And they're, they're also in uh, Twice Told Over. Okay. Early morning chat with God. This morning, I'm back to asking for patience. With my cup of coffee, I sit outside to say hello to you, God, my Jiminy Cricket, my salsa dancing quick with a dip amigo. We have a very collegial relationship. I laugh at all your jokes and praise the wonders of a sky's watercolors. I know you like me a benign affection and tolerance as I run around like a chicken with its head cut off, a gruesome image, nevertheless hilarious like a grisly cartoon, the blood splurting, the body winding down to zero, the crashing into unforeseen objects. I think if I were back on my great-grandmother's farm, the farm that I know only through stories my mother tells of Bluefield, Nicaraguas, Nicaragua, a tortilla filled with just enough, and I saw the long, scrawny neck and the ax, I would be sick to my stomach. The aimlessness of her final strut, the reality of blood loss, her claws scratching the dirt, kicking up rocks of panic. But when she stops, into the pot she goes, a meal, what we need to continue. Her flesh simmered off the bone, Delicious, in a tomato sauce flavored with green peppers and onions. Transformation. The feathers plucked, soil and dust washed away, the table set. Goblets of red wine, white china plates, a cast iron pot twirling a bay leaf scented steam. Then a prayer and gratitude that we have enough to make it through another night alone a night filled with longing whispers and the turbulence of dreams. <clears throat> and then uh, this poem is called uh, Between Two Languages. And so uh, my brain is a bilingual brain. Um, I learned Spanish first, and then around age two, I started going to public education and learned English. And so um, I naturally can do, it's very interesting. I, I would think if you weren't bilingual, how they flow together without any interruption between two languages. Misericordia translates to mercy, as in God have mercy on our souls. Then piedad, pity us, the poor and suffering, the lost and broken. Have mercy, then piedad, misericordia, a compassionate forgiveness, carries within miseria, 
misery. The stifled cry on a midnight bus to nowhere. And yes, the hunger. A starless night's piercing howl. The shadows within shadows under a freeway overpass. The rage that God might be laughing. Or even worse, silent, gone, a passing hallucination. Our nerve-wrecked bodies tremble. Our eyes have trouble peering into night. Let us hope for more than what can possibly be. Señor, ten misericordia de nosotros. And if we are made in the image of God, then we can begin heading toward the ultimate zero, the void that is not empty. Forgive ourselves. And remember the three seconds when we caught a glimpse of someone else's stifling cry, compassion, then miseria, our own misery intensified by the discordant ringing of some other life, our ultimate separation, our bodies intolerably unable to halt the cacophonous clamor of unanswered prayers. But nevertheless, we must try for no reason at all. Once more, Señor, ten misericordia de nosotros. Forgive us for what we cannot do. And I'm going to end with one other poem from Volcanic Interruptions. And um, Nicaragua is part of the Ring of Fire, and there's volcanoes. El Salvador tiene volcanoes. Um, and so I just grabbed onto this metaphor of the volcano for this book. And um, there's an image that keeps recurring that I'm going to be an old lady in Nicaragua, and the volcano is going to explode, and that's how I'm going to die. And it keeps happening over and over. So here's one of those poems. Before the volcano blows, I will speak Spanish to many stray dogs with fleas and find my way to a nameless street where angels spoke to my mother as a girl. Momotombo will simmer its vengeful breath rumbling and roaring in the background. It will be a simple matter by then to stand at the edge of a world gone mad since all the secrets will have been released into the rainforest canopy between Managua and Leon. The few vowels left will explode from parrots squawking, and truth will wearing down upon all who accompany the poor and tired, endlessly scratching memories. This is all because of my mother's whispers and that I can never remember her exact birthday. Was it on the 22nd or the 28th that she broke into the world with a cacophony of lament and taught me to hide within the walls of my own deception? Too many have withstood the cataclysm of broken doors, the harangue of voices that never cease, the visceral schema of too much that has come before. When I finally arrive with my own broken being packed tight in a worn leather bag, I will not cry into satin blankets. Instead, I will sip mint tea with two ice cubes slowly melting as my hair curls into ash and dust. Thank you. The experience of immersing oneself within Edenist poetry is the experience of submerging one's entire self one sense of being into a beautiful system of roots, raw and sprawling, Irena's roots reach out toward infinite possibility through her masterful fashioning of lyrical beauty, etching itself onto the topography of the body. In a word, Irena's poetry is tenderness in its most cavernous and intimate sense. In her poem, Diabetic Love Song, Irene writes, I will always be working on letting go of things that hurt me, will always be intent on healing, on becoming stronger, and sometimes that will make me flint-faced and harsh, and sometimes it will make me the compassionate being I want to live my life as. 
Irene's poetry teaches us all that healing and strength and even the continuous nature of self-excavation and revelation comes bearing many faces, the self as something multitudinous and marked by all that has been and all the possibilities of what's to come through the stretching out of all of our roots. A weaver of stories, a writer, a poet, Irene Lara Silva is the author of three chapbooks, Animal, Indigena, and Enduring Azucares. Her two full-length poetry collections, Furia and Blood Sugar Canto, were finalists for the International Latino Book Award in Poetry. Her most recent poetry collection, Huicacali House of Song, was a finalist for the Texas Institute of Letters Poetry Prize. Her first collection of short stories, Flesh to Bone, was published by Antloop Press in 2013. Flesh to Bone received the 2013 Premio Atlan, placed second for the 2014 Texas National Association for Chicana and Chicano Studies Foco Award in Fiction, and was a finalist for Forward Review's Book of the Year Award in Multicultural Fiction. It and his poetry, short stories, and essays have appeared in more than 70 journals and anthologies, including Accentless Review, The New York Times, Alaska Quarterly Review, Pleiades, The Rumpus, Apogee, and Texas Highways Magazine. Irene is currently a writer at large for Texas Highway Magazine and is working on a second collection of short stories titled The Light of Your Body and a fifth collection of poetry coming out in January 2024 from Saddle Road Press titled The Eaters of Flowers. Irene's work has an aching quality to it. The words reach out and touch you. They at times lovingly, at others painfully, rifle around inside you, and when you think you can't feel any more passionately than you do in that moment of reading her work, the poem ends and leaves you suspended within your own swell of emotion, tendrils of Irene's language still lingering within yourself. Her poetry has an intense way of connecting to readers, of affecting readers, leaving everyone who's had the pleasure of indulging themselves with her work forever connected to her and her language. In an interview with Nina Garcia from the Feminist Book Club, Irene once said that, quote, I realized that I had to reimagine what writing was because I liked my life and I no longer needed to escape it. Writing became about finding a way to more fully be in the world, in my life, in my heart. It wasn't until after the publication of my first full-length collection, Furia, that I learned that writing was about something beyond myself, that it was about creating dialogues with others and between others, end quote. It is my personal hope that hearing Irene's lovely reading of her work will allow for all of us to be more fully in the world and more fully in ourselves. That being said, let us all now enter into dialogue with and warmly welcome poet Irene Lara Silva. Y'all are killing us with these intros. These <laughs> intros are gorgeous. Um, I, I don't want to repeat too many thank yous, but Francisco, as a person who has organized a crap load of things, I am in awe of your organizational abilities. I felt every single second like everything was in place. It's beautiful. Um, also, I think I deserve extra credit because in their thank yous, they left out the creative writing program. But I got you. I got you, OK? So thank you to the creative writing program. For, your, for funding and for, um, for supporting this. I was listening. I was listening. I was paying attention. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, I'm going to start off with what I call the, the, uh, the heart poem. I think in every collection of poetry, there's one poem that if you can write that poem, then you can write the rest of the collection. Um, if you can't write that poem, then you're out of luck. So. Uh, this was the heart poem for, for the Cuicacali collection. And the whole collection kind of is concerned with the idea of Latina identity in that difficult space between um, having indigenous ancestry, growing up with indigenous culture, but not being able to claim Native American because of federal recognition and status and history and everything else. So what do you do in that space? And I, as I was telling Kristen earlier, if you just reject it because you feel like you can't authentically claim it or, or, or that you can take the title, and then what that ends up doing is it, it, it shames you and it throws you into a space where you have no option other than to, you know, to give in to assimilation. So, so I've been resisting all of that. And so, but anyway, but so this is the, the heart poem of this book. And it came to me when I was standing at a bus stop in Austin, uh, which is where I live. Um, 
And I was looking up at the night sky, and it was so beautiful. And so these lines came. It seems to me the stars are enduring. Here where I stand, the ancestors stood. The same wind, the same night sky, the same trees, the same sweet scent of grass. I touch my face, and the hand touching my face is a hundred hands deep. We are like lost children who do not know our birth names, do not know our birth mothers, as if we had been taken, as if we had been abandoned, as if we had been raised in a world without mirrors. The world confuses history with truth, victims with survivors, lines on a map for reality. The headlines proclaim us foreign, dangerous, and dark-skinned hordes invading what has never existed. This is my earth, not theirs. It has always been my earth. Taste it and my blood and your tongue will confuse the two, the one. This sky and my spirit, also one, the same ardent shade of blue. And this is my face, my face as it has been for a thousand years, all my mother's faces. I walk the same steps, listening to a half song, dreaming a half song. My voice fashions a half song, but my hands are not half hands. My heart is not a half heart. My blood is not half blood. My soul is not half soul. If I stand, they stand. If I live, they live. If I breathe, they breathe. If I speak, they speak through me. If I heal, they heal through me. I am never alone. I am never only one. I am the embodiment of a thousand years desire to survive, to live, to be free. Here where I stand, the ancestors stood. The same wind, the same night sky, the same trees, the same sweet scent of grass. I touch my face, and the hand touching my face is a hundred hands deep. It seems to me the stars are enduring. So I was waiting to see if Jose Limon was going to make it to our reading. And he did. He did make it. So I'm going to dedicate this next poem to Jose Limon, because sadly he lives in California. <laughs> which is very far away from the Whataburgers in Texas. <laughs> if y'all do not know the Whataburgers in Texas, come to Austin. I will take you to one, okay? Um, but So I was telling him that this poem was inspired by a 3 a.m. craving for Whataburger um, <laughs> with bacon. Uh, I don't have jalapenos, but a lot of people do, and you can get jalapenos at Whataburger. Um, but also this book is concerned, well, I'm concerned, a lot of my work has to do with creating new myths but also with working with old myth, because I think old myth is not done with us. Otherwise, we wouldn't keep reworking stories of like the Orona and Malinches and different uh, deities. Um, and so I wanted to write a poem about Sipakli. And for those of you who don't know Sipakli, uh, Sipakli was a, a being or deity that was non-binary. And Sipakli is described as sort of looking, I don't know, some, somewhat co crocodile-ish and having a mouth at every joint in their body. And Quetzalcoatl and another uh, god took Sipakli and changed their body and made it the earth. And in order to appease Sipakli's rage at having been taken this way, they created the mountains and the trees and the rivers. And so that's Sipakli. <clears throat> so between um, the craving for Whataburger, thinking about Sipakli, it being three o'clock in the morning, and my liking to take road trips, this poem happened. Road tripping with Sipakli. Feed me wildflowers. Feed me road. Feed me sky, you say. Your crocodile mouth shaping each word strangely but ecstatically. Fill my eyes, my stomach, my hands, all of me, you say. Your crocodile hand with its webbed fingers trying to catch the wind. We drive over a bridge, the air changing slightly. You lean back in your seat, closing your eyes, taking in the sensation. We drive for miles and miles, south and further south. No houses, no towns, only mesquites and nopales and more mesquites. You're always hungry. We stop for burgers in Carrizo Springs. We use the drive through You eat yours all the way with bacon and cheese and jalapenos. We feed chicken tenders to all your other mouths. One of them has a sweet tooth and wants ice cream. We feed it an apple pie. I might be getting too comfortable with you in the car. I almost lose a finger. 
we don't stay there for long, someone might have seen you. I keep checking the rearview mirror, no sign of the Scatlipoca or Quetzalcoatl. Still, it doesn't hurt to be cautious. I decide it's time to go east, Highway 85. You don't say anything. You're too busy working my phone, trying to choose what music you want to listen to next. In Austin, you kept flipping back and forth between Willie Nelson and Ruben Ramos. In San Antonio, it was classic Tejano with lots of Selena, La Mafia, and Maz, and Elsa Garcia, and some Ramerera. After Uvalde, it was all Chente and Jose Alfredo and Lucha and Chavela. Finally, you put the phone down. There are so few cars on the road, I feel safe hitting 90 miles an hour. All of the huge bugs we're killing with the windshield are dying to the sounds of El General, Don Omar, and Ivy Queen. I love the road, you exclaim, your body shivering from top to bottom. I just grin, showing all my teeth. I know what you mean, I say. There's nothing like it. I don't know where we're going. I didn't ask any questions when you showed up at my door and said, I've got to get out of town. I grabbed a change of clothes, some water, my bag, my keys. Everything else was already in the car. Serape, pillow, machete, the essentials. It was still dark when we left in the still cool morning of spring. I feel a sudden longing for the beach. I turn to look at you, wondering if that's what you need. The Gulf, South Padre is too crowded. But we could head towards Port Isabel, then take the one road that goes and goes, trees and grass giving away to sand dunes and open sky. I could take you there. You look at me suddenly, your eyes intent, your words low and careful. I won't let them take me again. I'd rather die. I don't say anything, I just nod. I don't call you corazón out loud, but you know it's what I always mean when I look at you. Not like I could talk around the knot in my throat anyway. But you understand, I won't leave you. Freedom or death. Whataburger poem. There you go, Jose. <laughs> <laughs> and interestingly, I thought of this one poem when uh, Kristen was introducing me. So I'm going to take it as that this was a sign that you want me to read this poem. And so, um, so I'll read it. But it actually was inspired by true events. I had just moved to a second floor apartment. And my brother, who, was, who had very limited mobility, um, was trying to take a nap. Somebody climbed onto the balcony of a second floor apartment and tried to get in through the patio sliding door. And it happened like three times. And I blew up, and I called the apartment complex, and I said, I am going to wait out there with a machete, and if somebody comes up, you're going to get body parts. Um, I need more light. There needs to be security. Y'all need to figure out what the hell you're going to do. But I, and I was furious. I was so angry. Um, Y'all don't understand. Like, I am capable of sitting out there in the dark with a machete. So, um, but I kept thinking about it, and I was like, why? I'm so angry. Like, I would go to work, and I was angry, and I'd come home, and I was still angry. I was like thinking of it getting broken glass and lining the patio and doing crazy things. Um, and then I thought, you know what? This is not just anger about the patio. It's not just anger about the door. And it's not just anger about you know security on the apartment complex. So then I wrote this. After the third time, the would-be burglar climbed into my second floor patio and tried the doors. It is night. It is dark here. I am in the shadows where I cannot be seen from the ground. Long bladed machete in hand. I am waiting for those hands, those fingers to grasp at the railing as he hoists his way up and over. I will collect my dew of blood and scream. I am waiting and as I wait, it comes to me that I am weary of tears, that we are all weary of tears, that my ancestors and my descendants are weeping and I can hear them weeping, and I can taste their tears. And this is what we have done, and what we have done, and what we have done, until we are sick with grieving. What has been taken, what is being taken, and what will be taken, I am weary of tears. I want blood. I want an infinite machete extending all directions in time. No one will touch my children or my ancestors with violence. Their blood will never be spilled, will never have been spilled, will not be spilling. 
No dying now or then or to come, no violence, no injury, no hurt, no woman, no child, no man, no person forced against their will, no patch of earth or water or sky violated or polluted, never violated in the time to come or the time that has passed. My infinite machete swung by my infinite strength. I will make a thousand layered necklace of severed hands to rest on my infinite chest. Let the fingers and limbs pile up in my wake. I am weary of tears. I am weary of grieving. They will not touch what is not theirs. They will not touch what is not theirs. The earth is screaming and singing through me, through me unleashed. I will collect my dew of blood and scream. They will not touch what is not theirs. They will not touch what is not theirs. I will take their hands, their fingers, their hearts for wanting, for having wanted what is not theirs. Not theirs, not theirs, not theirs, not theirs. These bodies, these histories, these dreams, these families, these lands, these skies, these nations, these people, these freedoms, they are not theirs to take. And um, Kristen was saying, so I just finished another collection of poetry, um, The Eaters of Flowers, that will be coming out uh, January of next year. And I want to share with you all the title poem as soon as I figure out where it is. Um, I thought I had it, but apparently it went back. Please talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> if not, I'm going to have to read you another poem. But I wanted this one. Apparently, I'm not going to get what I want. OK. So here we go. Do you all know what descansos are? They're, um, I see them a lot in Texas. I don't know if they exist in other places. But usually, let's say somebody dies in a car accident. Uh, the place where they died, somebody will put a cross or balloons or flowers. It'll, they'll make a little memorial of it. Uh, and so that's what a descanso is. Descanso translates basically to, not quite resting place, but like that idea. Um, and I, what was I doing? I was hosting a friend of mine, and I went to go get his dinner. And on the way, I, I passed by three different descansos. And I was like, I, I want to write a poem about this. So this is in, in the collection, the new collection. Got to be able to see these tiny, tiny letters. And The Eaters of Flowers, it's basically a collection that I wrote in a very short period of time. Um, it basically, in two months, I wrote the entire book uh, because it was after my, my youngest brother, who was also my adopted son, passed away. Um, and I was trying to figure out how I was going to keep on what I was going to make out of life. So this poem is part of that collection. Descanso. I notice them everywhere I go. I always have. Today, on the same street, I saw three of them, different sizes. One not much more than a cross with plastic red and white roses. One covered in blue flowers and a wooden slat with a name and a date. And one with only slightly sun-faded star and heart-shaped balloons. Four bouquets of plastic flowers, Mardi Gras beads, a sunshine yellow cross with blessed written and turquoise paint. When I see them, I don't cross myself like I do when I pass by cemeteries and graveyards. I don't know what to call that fractional moment of acknowledgement, which is me all at once crossing myself and sending a prayer and thinking of the deceased and thinking of the mourners and a small salutation to death herself. But all of that happens in a flash, which is neither sad nor afraid, but is real. I think of how it makes sense to mark the place of loss with flowers and balloons and bright colors how that sends a continuous burst of love to their lost one, how it must be a way to begin to heal the rip of sudden death, perhaps a painful death, and how acknowledging the loss hurts less than passing by that place and seeing nothing to mark where it happened. 
What I have discovered in these months of loss is that the descanso for his loss is not necessarily where his body rests now. It's not even the place where he left this life. It doesn't matter where I am or where I go. I carry his descanso with me everywhere I go. I carry it in my chest. Here in my chest, where his leaving left a hole so big, there was hardly enough flesh to keep me together. Here in my chest is where I bring all the flowers, where I leave all the brightly ribbed memories, all the silver medallitas of all the things that meant so much to us both, where I carry all his favorite things, and where I put all the things he would have loved that he will never see or know or taste. Here is where I carry all the balloons lighter than air and heavier than grief. I am the descanso. Thank you. Can we give it up one more time for our poets? I'm now going to invite Kristen to join our poets to moderate a conversation. Hi. Different view. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Is this too close? Can you all hear me? Thumbs up. A little cool. closer. Yeah, you can't hear it. Hello. Okay. <laughs> basically have it on the lap. Cool. I can barely hear you, so. Sorry, sorry. There we go. <laughs> okay, cool. So um, the way we were going to sort of go about navigating this conversation was to have each of our lovely poets um, read a snippet from their essays from this anthology um, that they all were contributors to. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, and sort of have these these uh, excerpts act as almost a conversational abstract um, for the conversation to follow. So if we can go ahead and get that started. Do we want to just pass it? Yes. Okay. I think internet is first. Okay. okay. All right. So this is from the essay uh, "La Desembocada: Healing the Wound That Never Heals." To write with duende is to struggle with your own soul and to birth words in the terrible aftermath. No superficial struggle will rust out truth. Here, the twisted river. Here, our braided blood. Here, two nations pulling and pushing on each other. Here, wound and not wound, line and not line, story and not story, silence and not silence. To live here strains the imagination, strains the heart. Pain may make us all recoil, but what is unique is how we resist, how we change to survive, what decades of struggle teach us about the strange work of healing and creation. How many years does it take to learn to see those possibilities? Um, this is from an essay called Trauma and the Lyric. It's Cheryl, yeah, you have to get close oh, to the mic. <laughs> <laughs> this is from an essay I wrote called Trauma in the Lyric. Telling our own stories and using our own language and customs rather than the stories, languages, and customs of others is one way we can process what has happened to us and move forward. Writing as medicine is what the lyric can be about for Latinos. A poem written from the first person perspective need not be labeled confessional or self-absorbed. Confessional implies that there is some guilt involved on the part of a speaker. The first person perspective is also a means to personal and social change. Personal emotions such as grief and anger must be expressed. To argue against the subjective experience is a way of silencing and dismissing trauma. Is it any wonder that anti-lyric sentiment has come about when minorities and marginalized groups are now finding their voices 
and publishing their stories. And then uh, my excerpt is from uh, how I came to identify as a Latina writer. By allowing my Latinidad into my poems, I allow myself to speak and break with the silence imposed on women and Latinas. Latinas can and should write in the details and language of their experience, and in so doing, perhaps expand what is conceived as American experience, but from an interior necessity, not a preordained agenda. Experience is what cultivates the creative imagination, the experience of a life lived, the experience of arguing with dead white men, the experience of being politically and culturally aware, the experience of everything that one can get her hands on. As a Latina writer, I have found the necessity to move beyond US American intellectual borders by looking to Latina and Latin American authors for inspiration. Thank you all so much. So that's gonna act as our sort of abstract when we uh, get into the discussion for the following three kind of chunky uh, questions. So to start off, um, taking a look at these moments in each of your essays that seem to lay so well together, um, how we change to survive, to argue against the subjective experience as a way of silencing and dismissing trauma, and by allowing my Latinidad into my poems, I allow myself to speak and break the silence imposed on women and Latinas. Um, conceptualizing all of that, lacing it together, um, what is at risk? Um, that is, what are the stakes of silence, especially for Latinas in particular? Um, and how might conceptualizing poetic creation and communication as transitory, as a means of malleably crafting and recrafting the self rooted in the subjective help stave off this risk? And we can go in any order you so choose, whoever would like to start. I need to look at that question. That's yes. over here. <laughs> There's a few words I'm not sure I got right. Let's see. Do you mind if I just go? Maybe? Go for it. Yeah. Go for it. Um, so, so what what's at stake is alcoholism, abuse, um, self hatred, um, all these negative things. Because if we're silent, that means we don't know who we are. At least maybe it's I'm a writer and I think that way, but I really think that if we're silent and we don't speak, then we internalize all the negative things that can go inside us and then we can lead to self-harm. And, and if not self-harm, it can lead to high blood pressure, <laughs> you know? And so, so speaking is a way of being and a way of saying that uh, my life matters, my life as a Latina matters, and that I deserve to stand on this planet with everyone else. I like that. <laughs> I, I was predisposed to want to argue with you, Adela. You're, you're not helping here. It's being very <laughs> um, But yeah, so how many of you, there's a Batman movie. I forget the exact phrase, uh, the exact quote, um, but what's his face? Yeah, I can't remember his name either. He tells Batman, <laughs> he tells Batman, you know, some men just want to see the world burn, mm -hmm. like the, that, that sort of destructive impulse. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was writing my first collection of short stories, I had, my first thought was that half of them were gonna be about self-destruction mm -hmm. and half were gonna be about self-creation or transformation. And what I realized when I was writing it was that it's very easy to write self-destruction. Mm -hmm. I'm very familiar mm -hmm. with it. It's very easy to figure that out. Mm -hmm. It's extremely difficult to do the other thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, what happened with poetry. If I hadn't had writing, I would have blown some stuff up. So. <laughs> So writing was the Viet, well, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the work of Rosemary Catacalos, a uh, Mexican Greek American poet who passed away uh, recently in San Antonio. And we were having a conversation on one of her birthdays. I, I want to say it was her 73rd birthday. And she said that she had lunch with a friend who asked her what she was proudest of in her life. Mm -hmm. And she said, it must be, you must be so proud of your writing career and the awards you've won and the books you published. And Rosemary told her, no, mm -hmm. it's not that. P 
poetry, it was, the, the end goal wasn't poetry or publication or prizes. Poetry was what I utilized to try to make myself the best version of myself that I could become. Mm. And to me, that was, that was the perfect articulation of what poetry and writing have done for me. Yeah. Without it and without what it taught me about transformation and healing, I would be running around destroying things and people. And seriously, <laughs> like, that's what I would be. I would, I would have been exactly like my father and, and all of his frustrated artists transformed into wanting to destroy the creative impulse in his children. Mm -hmm. And I could have become something like that. Mm -hmm. but, but through poetry and through writing. So that's, I mean, we, we talk a little bit about you know, the, the, the dangers of not being creative. Um, but it is true. I mean, we think sometimes of art as things that we uh, consume. You know, music we buy, art we buy, entertainment we seek out. But it's a, it's there. They are ways of so much more of how we see the world and how we live in the world and how we walk in the world and how we create community and how we affect others and how we even manage to connect with other people. So if we're silent, all of that goes away. Mm -hmm. All of it. Cheryl. Um, I wanted to talk about something that was drilled in my head when I was working on my doctorate many, many years ago, I was told you must write from a place of universality, mm -hmm. that a young boy in Connecticut would be able to relate to what I was writing. And I was literally told that. I mean, this is a direct quote, pretty much. And sure. I think that, that no, you know, there are multiple experiences, and um, Latinas are often silenced in those environments where objectivity and rationality and the male lens are kind of um, looked, looked upon with awe and, and reverence. Whereas if you write a poem about your grandmother, your, your Mexican grandmother, I have many times heard that kind of mocked, and that, you know, that's just silly. Why would you want to do that? Mm -hmm. That's another way of, of, of silencing traumas and keeping women, Latinas, silent. And I think it's important to speak out, you know, to find your voices and uh, share that with other people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Um, Something I find really interesting is that it's it's reflected in all of your work, this sort of question of what is at stake, and sort of all of you touched on um, the self and, and the erasure of the self and the potential for an erasure of not just the self as the singular, but the self as a whole tradition or a whole um, line or legacy. Um, and something that I, I hope everyone got to take note of in the reading today was that each one of you approaches that in a very different way, but a very um, musical way. All of your work is so, so musical and rhythmic and, and the momentum of the movement sort of just is a, an epitome of that attempt at resistance and resilience. And I think it's a very beautiful gift you all have. Um, so is it possible, thinking of your own poetics and conceptions of poetry, to create a selfhood located in multiplicity? Um, you all talk so much about the uh, communal, communal, about lineage, both personally in terms of familial, but also in literary tradition, um, and about constantly reimagining the self when writing poetry. Um, do you see a possibility within poetry to create a self that is multiple rather than isolated and singular? And if you do, uh, how might we envision particularly Latinx, Lat Latina poet poetics in particular functioning in this way? Yeah, I'll jump in. I do believe I read a line that says something about I am never alone. And I think that's one of the places to start with the idea of how we are our multiple selves. Um, because first of all, even the idea that we are ever alone is a, is a foreign thing. We're never alone. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, there's, there's everything. There's all of existence, all of creation, nature, the world, other people, family, memories, the future, the past. We are never alone. Mm -hmm. We are never isolated. So how do we reflect that in writing when the, 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 you know, the dominant discourse has asked us to consider the world from a place that is isolated and alone? Um, I guess I, I would describe it more as, you know, if you, if you approach your, your life and the way you live in the world in a more indigenous sense, then that's not even a question. Mm -hmm. But how do you make the language which you have been educated in that tells you everything is isolated and disparate and fragmented and that can't come together, can't join, can't connect, um, you know, that then is the project of poetry, mm -hmm. to reconnect all of that, to make it so that we can see how obvious those connections are and that they've always been there. I talked to my friend about I talked to my friend about this question and she said what rivers what rivers have flowed through your to you through your work um and I thought that was an interesting way to look at identity identities um uh one thing I like about this anthology is that um it he shows how our ethnicities like Latino is just not a monolith. There's there's a wide variety and fluidity to 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 those labels, I guess you could say essentially, you know. Um, we what what flowed, what rivers flowed through me were some of the stuff I've talked about. Uh, also I write about mental health, which is uh, a different take on things in some ways. I write about El Paso, which which is very dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I, I believe in the fluidity of ethnicity. Um, just we're all different. We're, we're not, we don't all have the same experiences. And so multiplicity comes, you know, so many ways in this mm -hmm. anthology. It's just, it's, I loved it. I love the essays. So thank you. Um, so, so for me, the idea of multiplicity is, um, I view it as my core and as something that I'm learning to live with every single day and celebrate. And it does um, where, so right now, if you could, if I could illustrate my mind, I'd be showing you all the different multiple boxes that are all connected together. Um, that's because that's how I, as I investigate reality and existence. That's what I keep finding. And it begins with uh, me being 14 years old and going to Nicaragua. My entire family's from Nicaragua. I could have been born in Nicaragua. I spoke Spanish first. And when I got to Nicaragua, everybody would say, hey, you're American, aren't you? You're from the United States. Eres una gringa, right? And I'm like, what? What do you mean? What do you mean? And then my family's from Nicaragua, and I'm being raised in Southern California. So I'm not Mexican-American, right? So it's like, oh, I don't know. Who are you? What are you, right? So, so there's a saying, Puerto Ricanos have this. They, 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 this comes from la gente que son Puerto Ricanos. Ni de aquí, ni de, ni de allá. Ni de aquí, ni de allá. And so you're, it's like nowhere, right? It, or at least that's what you think at first. Then you realize, thanks to Gloria and Zoldua, that it's not nowhere, it's multiplicity. It's mass, it's two, it's three. It's, it's Nicaragua, it's the US, and then it's Nicaraguan American, and it's Mexican American Nicaraguan, and it all starts to multiply out. And it's humongous, and it's amazing. And then that's only with identity. Then you apply that concept out of language to identity, to culture, to sexuality, to spirituality, to our being. And we tap into um, what I'm finding is a truth of existence, is this multiplicity. And so um, in regards to the Lat Latino poetry, or Latinx poetry, again, one of the things is that Latinx poetry isn't one thing. You know, the, the U.S. Latino experience is multiple in its very definition of what Latino is. And then, and the, my poems, and I see it in my poems, it's very interesting this time being here with you, I'm actually thinking about my poems, that, like not as me, the writer. I'm like, oh, what are they gonna say about my poems? Right, so I'm trying to look at them from outside, and I'm finding that there's a lot of multiplicity in my poems. And I do that I'm re because it's my truth, my understanding of reality. So like the details in time, 
crashing all together? Yeah, so that, so multiplicity to me is central to my, to what I'm discovering. Adela, I'm gonna need an ML, MLA style citation <laughs> on, on the oh, origin no. of ni de aquí ni de allá, because I really thought that I was Mexican. Oh! Okay. <laughs> I can play you a ranchera by, with that title right now. In like two seconds, I'll find it on YouTube. Oh, oh, so I need oh. some footnotes here. I need something. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, it could it could be it could be both. It could be both. Looking for and any point else of argument. Cover, cover the top, you know, it's gonna be Dominican from the from the Dominican Republic. That's probably who did it. No, she's not gonna buy it. She won't. Okay. No, I swear. We, oh. <laughs> Documentation, please. <laughs> any any point for argument? Any point? <laughs> okay. Um, well, on um, on trauma. So Cheryl, you mentioned that you know you write a lot on trauma, and that's um, not something you see that much in um, at least in, in Mexican American like Latinx poetics. It's it's interesting in how. Um, the way you weave it into your poetry is is very beautiful and imagistic and emotive. Um, but there's something that that truly marks you um, after reading your poetry in a very beautiful, beautiful way, but in a very um, harrowing way almost. It stays with you and it haunts you. Um, so this next question is on um, indelible marks um, from trauma. So Cheryl references in her essay, uh, Jeffrey C. Alexander quoting, trauma occurs when individuals and groups feel they have been subjected to a horrendous event that leaves indelible marks upon their consciousness, mm, will mark their memories forever, and will change their future in fundamental and irrevocable ways. Um, so how might our existence simply as Latinas um, leave us indelibly marked? And do you envision poetry highlighting these marks covering them up, um, mending them, filling them in, or some combination of these functions, or perhaps none of these functions. You don't know, I'm looking at you to like come for me for the none of these functions. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought she said the nanny. Um, yes, she's, she's taunting me. <laughs> okay. The question was directed at you first. Okay, um, I think well, there's a lot of things I wanna say, and I don't wanna go over time too much, but um, when I was running in Lubbock, Texas, I guess it was in the 80s, someone screamed out, go back to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a family with an abusive white stepfather. Um, and I, he was always saying, this is America, speak English. This is America, speak English. So I, you know, my identity was confused to say the least. So I, um, I left El Paso to Texas, experienced more than that incident. I mean, I, I had never experienced that in El Paso. So that made me realize, you know, where I was from, who my family was, and uh, I, uh, I think that left a, an indelible mark on me. It, it changed how I viewed myself and uh, I began to understand the silencing that we talked about. Uh, but yes, I think there's cultural trauma, generational trauma, individual trauma, and Latinos have a, a long history of being traumatized. I, 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 I mentioned in the essay the, uh, the, the men who came and were showered. I don't remember what they sprayed them with, but it was not water. DDT. And they say that Hitler got the idea for the death camps and the gas chambers from that incident. So I think, uh, I, I think that trauma is very essential in overcoming trauma as a community uh, or, or however we need to do it, we need to do that healing. And I think finding your voice or your voices is, is essential, essential for that. So there's two, two ways that I really like to start talks with people. Uh, one of them is by saying, we're all going to die. Like, not right now, uh, hopefully, but eventually we're all going to die. And, and that's just, you know, all of us. Um, the other thing I love to say, and I said it earlier today already, so now I get to say it twice in one day, um, is that life is full of pain and suffering. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> but 
And that's uh, that's everywhere. Um, so it sometimes strikes me as really interesting that people would think literature by Latinas is only going to be appreciated by Latinas, mm -hmm. as if we are not also living life and suffering pain and trauma and realizing that mortality mm -hmm. and falling in love and falling out of love and whatever other you know losses and and gains and victories and triumphs and joys there there are in life. Like that's everybody. Yes, I think you know there's very specific, you know, historical traumas uh, and experiences and ways of looking at that. As much as as women, you know, we were talking a lot earlier about violence and abuse and 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 what that does. Um, so all of that is there. Oh, but going back to the indelible marks, I I really have a problem when. Mexican American or Latina or these or different uh, ethnic or racial identities are only seen as a source of pain and not as a source of resistance or resilience or, de or adaptation. Um, like, well, so I, you know, earlier on we were ranting about tamales. Um, I don't know if you all have ever been subjected to these Facebook, you know, crazy things about tamales, the food. Um, People are always arguing, how do you spell it? Does it have an E? Is it tamal? Is it tamale? Does it have an S? You know, should you eat it with ketchup? Should you eat it with salsa? You know, how, how do you eat it? Where do you eat it? All these other things. Um, and I'm like, I don't care. I am so happy that tamales still exist 500 years after the conquest. That's what I'm happy about, you know? Some people speak Spanglish, some people speak California Spanglish, Calo, Tex-Mex Spanish, indigenous Mexican Spanish, you know, Spain Spanish, whatever. I don't care either. I'm so glad they're speaking whatever they speak and that they're speaking any part of it. And, and all of that, that, that idea of what is authentic and what is real, you know, causes all this shame. And so I feel more like the indelible marks are not from the experience of, of living or the experience of being Latina, they come from all of these uh, situations where we are shamed mm -hmm. for being this or for being that or for taking on whatever, rather than just celebrating the fact that the fact that we are not one homogenous blob means that our particular, our specificities, our histories have survived mm -hmm. and are still surviving and are still fighting. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so. So yes, yeah, so I, I want to kind of question a little bit, not a little bit, a lot, how we look at indelible marks and what the sources of our pain are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so when, you, when, when I was thinking an indelible mark and uh, injury and it becomes a scar and um, the scars don't go away, they're scars, right? There's a scar on your body and, and it comes from what all, both of you were saying, the, the history, the personal, and and these scars are there. So then what can art do and, and what can we do? And I think we can, and especially in a Catholic institution, um, what can we do? We can transform this pain into something else. Um, and so in a poem, we can transform it into community, right? So we, we share our journey with, you know, <laughs> It takes a lot to write a poem about a, tr a scar. <laughs> and so if we're brave enough to write that poem and put it out in the world, then we're creating a community, reaching out a hand to somebody else who's going through that. Um, and if it's larger than that, we can then uh, change the misconceptions of what history is. Um, and, and so we can transform it. And then, of course, with the spiritual, um, we can transform this pain into uh, something more than that. And, and oh, that's what that poem was that I read, Misericordia. I, uh, the reason I wrote that poem is I was shocked. In the moments of my pain, I was more compassionate to those around me. And I was shocked at that. I was shocked. I was like, ¿Qué es esto? Right? Why am I being nicer to people? Right? Shouldn't I be? Yeah. But I, I, I was shot. It wasn't me. That was, that was God. That wasn't me. That was God. And so, uh, but I think we can do that in our poetry. I think poetry can do that. I think we can do that in our lives. We can transform. Um, but we can't take away the scar. It's always there. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. <laughs> um, I'm looking over. How are we doing on time, Francisco? <laughs> We're doing okay. Francisco nice. says big old clap. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much for answering those questions. Um, I hope that this was nice and you took some things away. Um, we're opening up the floor to audience Q&A. So anyone just... All of you owe us 20 bucks if somebody doesn't come up with a question in 30 seconds. <laughs> I don't have $20. <laughs> um, so I have a question. Instead, I'll trade you a question. Um, Cheryl, I know that you wrote about running, and I feel like I should have asked you this earlier today. Um, do you ever feel like you're still running? Mm -hmm. Less so. Less so, but yes. Yes, I do. I, uh, I, uh, was homeless for a little while. Not very long, but that's kind of like, uh, it takes a while to get over. You know, you have housing, you're like, oh, uh, isn't gonna last, and those type of things kind of bring you back to that. So I was a runner too, that's why I had to. Yeah. Oh, I meant metaphorically. You know, I see uh, obviously three very talented Latina poets here uh, in front of us, but um, I'm very curious, what is your relationship, if any, to the previous generation of women who wrote poetry and in most cases somewhat identified as Latinas, although the, the tradition I know best identified as, as Mexicans in some form or fashion. I'm thinking, for example, of Lorna de Cervantes mm -hmm. and Pat Mora and the Latina or Mexican-American authors that Marta Sanchez examined in a book that almost everyone has forgotten now on Chicana poetry. And I'm just curious whether you're still in communication with those folks in the same way that you are with each other and, and with contemporary writing or not. You don't have to be. I'm just curious. Well, I, I'm going to jump in there because Irene's poem about standing out there with all the antepasadas and their, they were, what, was it touching your face, the image? Yeah. They're all touching our faces. That Lorna and Pat Moore, all those poems was when I was an MFA student, when I was a grad student. I had to read those. And, you know, so I love, I think, remember her poem, The Last of It? That. Yeah, all those, all those women are there. <laughs> that and even broader, I mean, because I always think of like Garmenta Foya, mm -hmm. who's one of the first poets I really, uh, Francisco X. Alarcón, you know, who, who passed away a few years ago. Um, I'm going to confess, this is the first time I do it in a big room. Um, the first book of Chicano poetry that I ever owned was Francisco Alarcón's Cuerpo en Llamas, Body in Flames. Oh, so the first Chicano book of poetry I ever owned was Francisco Alarcón's uh, Cuerpo en Llamas, Body in Flames. I say owned, but I stole it. Um, I was a very poor college student. Um, I told him so. I confessed to him personally. I didn't pay him money. I bought him a taco. Um, but, um, but no, I, I, I agree. I mean, they're always there. Um, and then broader two Native American poets like Joe Harjo, uh, African American poets like Sonia Sanchez and Nikki Giovanni, and uh, just you know all of these voices. They're, they're all touching us all the time. They're all, um, who is, I think it's Joy Harjo was saying that, that each poem has its own ancestry. And there's something beautiful about when, I, I was reading something and another friend came along and said, oh, I see the influence of so-and-so in this poem. I see how it, you know, it, it's, it's riffing on the same rhythm or it took some of the theme or, or some of this language, like it's the little pieces that, that, that hit us so deeply that not only did we have to to respond to them, but we learned something about language. We learned something about uh, speaking truth. We learned something about beauty by listening to them and reading them and still continuing uh, to read and to, to appreciate their work. Um, I read Lorna de Cervantes' Implumada when I was at UTEP as an MFA student. It had a it had a big effect on me. And I was able to meet her because I moved to Denver. I, I think she, um, in some ways, has mentored me uh, in terms of the writing, you know, maneuvering through the writing world. She, uh, 
she is a phenomenal poet, and I admired her early on. And for Pat Mora, she's from my hometown, El Paso, Texas, and she uh, she has I, I I don't remember what her book was called, but I read her her one of her books, and I found her to be an essential voice in terms of writing about El Paso. And uh, but I think. Uh, Another thing that affected me, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Ricardo Sanchez's uh, Stupid America. Am I, do I have that right? Yes, that, that was uh, something that I think was essential. Do you know what I'm saying? That poem kind of punched out, and it kind of said, we're not going to take this anymore. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I think, too, seeing the artist, do you know what I'm saying, in the, in the young Chicano boy, you know that we need those those kind of um, mentoring relationships with with people. Uh, I think the the irreverence and the bravery to write such a poem stays with me. You know, I think I think to write good poems, we do have to take risk. But well, one thing before we move to another subject, the interesting thing I'm finding now, I think, as I was telling uh, Kristen earlier. <laughs> You work so hard to get to that first book, and then more books come and more time passes. And so what's really interesting, I think, now is now to be, you know, to have the, you know, we, we, we have learned from and we have read the poets before. And in many ways, we've learned to, to mentor and speak and work with each other. But I think what's really fascinating right now is how that then extends to now reaching out to poets that are younger, you know, that are 10, 20, 30 years younger, and and to see how, in a certain way, we're not just talking to them, but we're sort of, I don't know, I don't I don't like thinking about time as being linear, but you know, this whole thing of combining the future and the past, and these are all conversations that are simultaneously happening, even if it's a poet, who, like Rosemary Gatacalos, whose work I absolutely loved, who's passed away, or a poet like Carmen Tafoya, who's still alive and, and working and making beautiful work to poets that we don't know yet who are working on their first books or, or finding their way to language, that all of that is constantly in flux and, and in dialogue with each other. Uh, other questions over there? I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to say this the right way, so correct me. But there's an impression I have of the way you three relate to each other in this public presentation. I don't know her. Yeah. <laughs> but in the public presentation that's presented today, as being comadres, as being more than just um, poets, mm -hmm. but being people who care about each other's work, if not actually care about each other's you know, lives and souls and things of that sort. And I also see the three of you, or my impression of the three of you, as transferring a special wisdom that would come from an abuelita, but to the broader public. And I'm not making a comment on your ages or anything like that, so please don't misinterpret me that way. Um, and is that correct? Is that correct that through your poetry you're able to, of course, share your wisdom, but it's a a wisdom of you of anyone's abuelita or bisabuela or you know however many generations there are and that you're also trying in your public dialogue when you have opportunities to be there with other female poets to show a type of comadrasco if you will that is overwhelmingly impressive <laughs> And power. I, I think what you're pointing out is what I would like to, to you know, um, okay, everybody hold on to your seats. There's a difference between Latino culture and white angle culture. Okay, so, so one of the things that with Latino culture that I think you're pointing out to is there's, um, I think we're tapped into nonlinear and communal ways of being. So we just met, but I think we inherently know that we have been on similar journeys and we are doing it together. So even though we've just met, sub we can feel it that we're connected. And I think maybe that's what you're picking up. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that was my, 
Yeah, I just met her today. Um, <laughs> you know, it's true. We just met. Yeah, uh, totally true. It sounds like a lie, but it's true. But Cheryl, now that I think about it, when I first met you, Cheryl volunteered to write the very first book review for my very first book. Ah. Didn't know her, hadn't talked to her much, but she just extended that hand so warmly. And it just, you know, I, I will always remember that that first review was from you. Um, but I was going back to the abuelita thing. Uh, so I had, of course, two grandmothers. One of them died before I was born. And the other one was very mean and hated my mother. So not a good grandmother example. Um, but, but, but what I'm going to, to transliterate here. Um, yeah, yeah, what, I, <laughs> what I'm going to transliterate from, from the abuelita sense, though, uh, other than a comment about any of our ages, is um, that for a lot of people, you know, abuelita it correlates with a kind of love, mm -hmm. you know, and and I think that's one of the things that that I love about Latina culture, and that I sometimes really love about that I think happens really spontaneously sometimes in gatherings of women, mm -hmm. um, this 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 ability, this desire, this this openness to say I don't know you, but but I recognize something of myself in you, and I already love you. You know, I was fighting with some people. I was fighting with them, not against them. I was fighting with them recently, mm -hmm. and I was like, and fighting with them just made me like love them to their essence. I'm pretty sure I'm going to love them for the next 40 years, <laughs> at least, or however long I have left of life. Um, but yeah, it's just that that willingness to love, and I think sometimes we associate that with abuelita, with abuelita ness, um, because it takes a while for most people to get there. It's so hard to learn to love, and it's so hard to learn to offer love, and it's so hard to learn to receive love. But I think that's what I equate with abuelitanas. So, you know, you write some poems, you suffer a bit, you live for a while, and then you can just come to people and just love them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah my, my grandmother was, like, harsh, mm. very harsh, abusive verbally to my mother. Mm. But, but like she would, all of my uncles, she would not call them by their name. She would call them capron. Mm. All, all five of them. <laughs> so, but, but you know, she would like stick $10 in my hand. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is for you. And so the, she was complex and loving and, uh, but I, I think that that is, for me, you know, what has me interested in the women in my life, in my, my life, <laughs> my lives. But uh, the women in my life are important, and I think that's what we what yeah. we relate with. Yeah. So. And and I I think it, it might this our reading perhaps or this event might be a little different than one that had mixed uh, event. But so I think there is you are seeing something about Latina culture. Right, that you're witnessing something about Latina culture, and it is the love, the community, bondad. Uh, we're not competitive. I'm not. We're not. There's no competi competition because we're all. Yeah. So, so it's very interesting. Thank you for that question. That's interesting. Now I want to see abuelitas in a SmackDown. Somebody send me a video. I want to see this. I want to see that. I know there's a TikTok out there somewhere. How, how about how about my abuelita? She used to have rolled up nylons, right? And she watched a Mexican wrestling. I think on a black and white TV. Is that okay? Is that unless girl? she's in the ring with a mascara? Oh. No. I was close. That's as close as I got. Mm -hmm. All right. One more question, or ten bucks each. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned kind of this, kind of this comparison between having an, indig an indigenous identity versus kind of this legal framework that identifies someone as a Native American, um, and it made me think. A, a couple of weeks ago, I had I taught a class about Afro-Cuban poetry and kind of talked about blackness in Latin America, and then used that to talk about different conceptions of race, kind of in the United States versus the Americas, and then how how they're different. Um, and, and one of those things was how kind of mestizaje was kind of this erasure of blackness from Mexico and from different countries uh, throughout Latin America. And, and I thought that exactly what you were saying, I was like, okay, this is a really interesting uh, kind of way to get at through another angle, kind of the erasure of the, like, kind of, you know, the indigenous person from uh, kind of like the Americas. Um, so how did you, re how do you reconcile that? Like, how, how did you, you know, in the poetry, like, you know, how do you conceptualize kind of race in that context? I think you have to, okay, 
coming from a weird angle. I think we learn best by following what we love. I think love is a solid connection. So if I say, you know, I love, you know, this about my indigenous culture, one of the things that I, I argue a lot is that Chicano, Chicanismo or Mexican American uh, without its indigenous component loses a lot because every healing tradition that Chicanos or Mexican Americans identify, those are all indigenous traditions. Mm -hmm. So if you want to wipe out the indigenous as being part of that, then you completely wipe out this whole history of healing and medicina and all of that. When I think specifically about like Afro roots, uh, of Afro Latino roots, or like with Mexico, you know, it's it's a race so much. Um, I remember there was somebody who, there, you know, how they they do the DNA test and there were people reacting to it and it was two Latinas and they were like, we're thirty five percent indigenous. How did that happen? Because you know, apparently they thought they were somehow like all Spanish and like some German or something, and they like you know like they said they had no palo en la frente. They had the it was very obvious they were indigenous. <laughs> And, and somebody was like, how could they think this? And I said, it's, it's, it's the way, it's what the culture is. My dad, who in one sentence would say that his great grandmother was completely 100% native, in the next sentence would then say that he was completely uh, Spanish, a Spanish descendant. And he all wondered why we didn't look like one of his sisters who was blonde and blue eyed. And I wanted to tell him, you married a dark haired, dark skinned woman. Um, you've been on the farm, you understand how this works. I don't know why you thought all your children were gonna be blonde and blue-eyed. Um, but it's that, that, des that desire to erase your, it's so, so intent. I, you know, I was trying to talk to my sister once about you know, the fact that we have like the indigenous and we have Asian and we have this. I said that we had some African in our, in our, you know, in our you know, whatever you call it, in our makeup, in our genetic makeup. I thought she was gonna kill me. She just was so outraged and could not believe. And it's like, and it's crazy how that happens. I mean, and you look at Mexican, in fact, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who's a dancer. And I was telling her like how I'd heard the story of how merengue came to be, that it was the enslaved peoples were shackled, but they learned to dance anyway, even with the shackles on. And that cumbias, which is there anything more Mexican than cumbias, are also part of, enslavement and how people learn to dance anyway, even in enslavement. Um, I recently wrote a poem about um, the Underground Railroad to the South, and the numbers are insane. And people are saying that those numbers are an undercount because I actually took a map and I measured the, the distance between from Georgia going to Canada or Georgia going to Mexico. It makes a lot more sense to go to Mexico because all the distances were shorter. Um, and people have erased all of that and one of the things that I find really interesting too is when you think about it, so if you had thousands, tens of thousands of enslaved people going to Mexico, marrying there, and then their descendants are returning here, they have a claim to America, to the US, mm -hmm. you know, because of that ancestry. And so I just, I, I find things like that fascinating, but it's so interesting how, how everything is, is subjected to forgetting. So I think remembering and loving and speaking are how we reconcile all of that. And on that note, thank you all for being here. Uh, come back at eight o'clock for our second session and there will be a reception at 7.15 just outside. <laughs>